person, uh, I want to welcome you here this evening to hear what I'm sure will be a thought-provoking conversation. Uh, it's got a nice title, Life and Death on the Frontiers of Global Health. Uh, we're going to hear a lot about some of the really interesting, pressing issues of our interconnected world. Before we start, I want to thank uh, the co-sponsors, uh, Kelly Brunell and the Dean here and the Sanford School of Public Policy. We thank them for this wonderful um, facility, that space. The Keenan Institute for Ethics and David Toole, who's here, who directs the Religions and Public Life Initiative there. And the program in American Grand Strategy, we have their beautiful poster here, uh, led by Professor Peter Fever, who I'm sure will be here. So tonight we're going to have a, here a conversation between a journalist and an expert. Our, our journalist will be Michael Gerson, who was previously a senior editor at U.S. News and World Report and now is a syndic national syndicated columnist for the Washington Post. His column appears twice weekly before joining the Post. He served under President George W. Bush in several roles, including director of presidential speech writing, an assistant to the president for policy and strategy planning, before becoming the Roger Hertog Senior Fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations from 2006 to 2009. Most importantly, while in the Bush administration, Michael was a key administration advocate of the pr President's Malaria Initiative, PMI, and the President's Emergency Fund for AIDS Relief, known as PEPFAR, which we'll hear uh, quite a bit about this evening. Michael is currently the 2015 Pamela and Jack Egan Visiting Professor at Duke. This is a um, professorship awarded to a journalist, a writer, or a commentator of distinction in a field related to the media and contemporary issues. Uh, this professorship brings Michael to campus several times to interact with students and faculty and to hold a public conversation with a notable figure. Michael was here last spring and discussed politics in Washington with his uh, fellow Washington Post col columnist E.J. Dion. And he's coming back on November 3rd under the auspices of the Religions and Public Life Initiative in the Keenan Institute for Ethics to discuss religion and politics in America in light of Pope Francis's upcoming visit to the United States. Michael's here tonight to have a conversation with Mark Dibel about global health. But before I introduce Mark, let's welcome Michael Gerson. We could not be more privileged to have Mark Dibel with us. He's a highly valued and respected global health colleague and currently is the executive director of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. For those of you unfamiliar with the Global Fund, it mobilizes and invests nearly $4 billion a year to support AIDS, TB, and malaria programs in more than 140 countries through partnerships between host government, civil society, the private sector, and people affected by these diseases. Mark has worked on HIV and public health for more than 25 years as a clinician, scientist, teacher, and administrator. Early in his career, he worked at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, where he conducted studies on HIV virology, immunology, and treatment, including the first randomized control trial with, with antiretroviral therapy, combination therapy in Sub-Saharan Africa. Mark was a founding architect and driving force in the formation of PEPFAR. After serving as its chief medical officer, assistant, deputy, and acting director, he was appointed the leader of PEPFAR in 2006, becoming the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator with the rank of ambassador at the level of an assistant secretary of state. He served in that capacity until 2009. Mark's leadership of PEPFAR and now the Global Fund makes him without question one of the great humanitarian physicians of our time and in our nation's history. Please join me in welcoming Mark Dibel back again to Duke. <laughs> this evening's discussion will touch on many topics. I'm not going to give them away. I'm going to turn it over to Michael to, to uh, introduce and start our discussion. At the end of this discussion, we will have some time for questions and answers. Thank you, Mike. 
Thank you all for coming tonight. I'm sorry my voice is a little bad because I was in four classes today. I'm glad to see some people that were in those classes. So it's, it's great to see you all. And thank you for coming. I think there may be some people from one here tonight, which is my institutional home, the one campaign uh, focused on uh, the fight against extreme poverty and preventable disease, leading advocacy organization. So I urge you to take a look if you're interested. I really appreciate the sponsorship tonight of the Duke Global Health Institute, the Keenan Institute for Ethics, and the Sanford School for Public Policy. This broad parentage is perfectly appropriate because the world's answer to the AIDS pandemic and other health challenges is, lies at the intersection of health, ethics, and politics with millions of lives depending on a complex global response. There's, in fact, no one I know who knows more about that response than Mark Dybul. He envisioned it as a researcher. He put it in a black briefing book for the President of the United States. He helped implement America's bilateral response and now leads the main multilateral response to AIDS, malaria, and TB. Mark also introduced me to the AIDS crisis in Africa on the trips we took together. Um, he in introduced me to the need but also to the extraordinary response of Africans, caring for the dying, taking care of orphans. At that point, it was like uh, trying to stop a wave with their bodies. They often failed, but they always tried, and they showed faith and courage and even cheerfulness in the midst of terrible tragedy. In that light, it was really an honor to take their side um, as we went fo forward with PEMFAR. The response of PEPFAR uh, required urgency, vision, and competence on a massive scale, and Mark provided all those things just at the time that they were most needed in history. But he also showed great moral commitment to human dignity, uh, putting a beating heart at the center of a vast enterprise. Um, getting to know Mark honestly has been one of the great honors of my professional life. He's a model of service to me. Um, Mark is used to answering my questions um, because he's uh, been my tutor over the years on the science of health. <clears throat> Nothing builds a bond between people quite like long, detailed discussions about adult male circumcision. <laughs> um, I also uh, want to mention that um, Mark's husband, Jason, is here, a Duke alum. You may have heard that already. but. Uh, which makes Mark a blue devil by marriage. Um, so, but a hoyer by... Uh, all right. So by Mark, him. thank you for joining us. It's a really pleasure that you're here. Thanks, Mike. And uh, I would say it's a great honor to be here for a variety of reasons. One, because um, of my husband's association with Duke. Also because of Mike Merson, who is uh, truly one of the great um, leaders in global health and created UN AIDS and many other things but also because of Mike Gerson, um, who is one of my heroes. Um, there aren't many people in policy in the world who take on these humanitarian issues. And I can tell you, PEPFAR wouldn't exist, President's Malaria Initiative wouldn't exist, the Neglected Tropical Disease Initiative that we also put forward wouldn't exist uh, without Mike's strong support. And he's just also a great person. So it's great to be here with you. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Mark, let me just start off by saying you've seen a, the AIDS crisis for 25 years now, right? I mean, you, what was your first experience as a doctor with HIV AIDS patients? Huh, I, that, I don't know. My memory's not that good. Um, I can tell you that um, AIDS was uh, before becoming a physician, so that, that's why it's hard to answer because um, I actually, this is a little strange, I hated science, still kind of do. Um, I, I was trying to decide between a PhD in English poetry and theology um, uh, when I was an undergrad and read a story, it was the front page of Newsweek, uh, on HIV in Africa. And uh, I actually changed my career and switched what I was going to do because of AIDS in Africa. It's one of those things that I read and it just grabbed hold of me in a way I can't describe. Um, and try very hard to ignore it because I didn't really want to do it. Um, my science class in Georgetown was uh, 
audio reproduction, which is how stereos work. You guys don't even know what stereos are, most of you. But, um, uh, Patrick Ewing, who was a basketball player, actually stayed in a class, science class I dropped out of because I didn't want to do all the work for it. So um, it really was because of HIV that I went into medicine. And so every moment from the day I entered medicine was related to HIV. So what then brought you to Tony Fauci at NIH? How did that happen? Um, like many things in life that matter, accident. Uh, so, um, you know, back then, it's hard to describe for those of you who might remember, certainly, but um, all we did as physicians, which we're not trained to do very well, is watch people die. Uh, we couldn't do anything for people with HIV. Um, we had a few drugs, but we were, I, I remember vividly being with a 15-year-old in, in a hospital in San Francisco dying alone because his family and friends had abandoned him because he had HIV and they didn't want to get near him. Um, so Tony was one of the leading scientists and is still one of the leading scientists in the world. And at the time, you know, just watching people die was not something I was particularly interested in, in doing. It was just too frustrating. So I wanted to go into research um, and had the naivete to think that I could do much in research. Um, but Tony really is an extraordinary guy. So he taught me a lot more than research, but so I went to him through a pathway um, to try to do more than just watch people die. Now, I, I was recalling our first trips. I remember visiting with you South African shanty towns where we mainly saw grandparents and grandchildren because an entire intervening generation was gone, was absent in these communities. Um, and it was really sobering. Um, give me an idea of when you started looking at a response, how bad the conditions were. What were you seeing at the time? What were the main obstacles when you started to design a response? So the, the places where the grandparents were the lucky ones because you know, we, have, we skipped probably the villages that were completely run by teenagers, by 13 and 14 year olds because there were no adults. Um, and they were taking care of all their cousins and children. And so you had 13, 14 year old head of households in an entire village. Um, it was extraordinary. It, it's, you can't describe it. You know, what we had in San Francisco where I did some work, what we had in New York, what we had in Chicago was, was horrific and almost beyond description unless you went there. Um, so the only, maybe one of the best ways to describe it is, you know, a lot of people in Africa move from uh, the country to the city, uh, and then they live in slums in the city. But they're very attached to their country, you know, the place they come from. They'll rarely say I was from Kampala, for example. They'll give you the name of their village. And when they die, they're taken back to their village to be buried. And literally on weekends in Kampala, for example, in Uganda, every road was clogged with coffins uh, because so many people were dying and so many people were going home. That's what it was like to be in these villages. The, there was no hope in life. Everyone assumed they were going to die from HIV AIDS. Everyone, everyone alive at that time in countries that were hardest hit assumed they were gonna die from HIV. Now imagine what that does to your life. You know, are you gonna invest in education? Are you gonna invest in trying to get a job or do better? It, it's impossible to describe the impact on these societies. There was nothing, there was no hope. In fact, Michael and I met uh, the, a child named No Hope, I Have No Hope. That's what a parent named a child, I Have No Hope. In Namibia, I remember In that. Namibia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's what it was. So the biggest challenge to moving things was actually vision. Uh, you know, you can list a thousand things that were a problem, supply chain, human resources, me trained medical professionals, and actually most of those problems still exist. They're better, but they still exist. The biggest problem was vision. Could we do something about it? And you, I thank God most of you are too young to remember, on the floor of the United Nations General Assembly, heads of public health organizations and heads of governments were actually saying antiretroviral therapy is impossible in Africa. They're not educated. They We'll never be able to implement something as complicated as antiretroviral therapy. It's not worth trying. So there was no treatment millennium development goal uh, because it was decided in 2000 that it was impossible to do it and it wasn't worth trying. 
So there's a the sense that it just couldn't be done. Uh, just, and it was based on such horrific, uh, paternalistic, uh, racist instinct that, and, you know, it, it was appalling. So the, the biggest issue was vision. It wasn't the detail. You know, the detail we actually worked out. It was believing that we could do it um, and them believing they could do it. And that's what changed everything. How did it develop? Where did that come from? Where did the faith that treatment could work, but also then where did scale come from and ambition in that system? Top and bottom. So the, the most important vision, and you know this, and um, uh, unfortunately not enough people do know, the biggest vision came actually from President Bush. So um, President Bush, uh, had a visceral reaction to that horrific, paternalistic, racist, Africa's a disaster, you can't do anything there. It's impossible to describe, and you know this, how, how he almost physically reacted when people talked that way. He just found it appalling that you would have that little hope or belief in another human being just because they lived in a continent. Um, and he knew the science. He actually knew that there was treatment available, that we could do it in this country. He knew all that. I mean, we rarely briefed him. He just started peppering us with questions about it. So he started with, uh, I, I, we, we have to be able to do this. Um, but then it was, how do you do it? Don't come back and say, you just need money. You know, tell me how you're going to do it. So some of us had the opportunity to go look and see what could happen. And people in the countries actually believed they could. So an organization called TASO in Uganda that was created by some women who were just, and some men actually, who were just sick of watching their families die. And they had these huge community programs. Now all they could do is to help people die, but they were out in the community doing extraordinary things. And then in Kampala, there was a guy named Peter Mugenye at the Joint Clinical Research Center that believed they could do antiretroviral treatment and started doing it there. They actually illegally flew in antiretrovirals when it was illegal in Africa. They flew them into Uganda. And they started treating people who could pay for it, because there were some people who could pay for it. Um, and then they started opening satellite clinics. And then there was a, a group in, in Western uh, um, Uganda, actually through, the, through TASO and through the US CDC that supported them, that was delivering antiretroviral therapy by motor scooter. They were getting pe drugs to people's homes, and you've seen that program. Um, so I was privileged to be in Uganda for some other stuff when I was at NIH, and I just happened to go around, and I, I couldn't tell anyone why I was doing it. I just told them I was interested, and, the president already started the Prevention of Mother and Child Initiative. But then you could take all that and draw, you could actually do budgets from that. You could look at and say, what did it cost to build that satellite clinic and staff that satellite clinic? What did it cost to do the antiretroviral therapy by motor scooter? And what's TASO doing in prevention? And what are some of the estimates that are out there? And then in Botswana, President Mohai, who really is a champion in all this, who, who really fought and said, I'm going to do this in my own country and pay for it. And he worked with Merck and the Gates Foundations and others and started providing antiretroviral therapy and built the system to do that. And everyone was basically telling him he was crazy. And he went ahead and did it. So we could learn from those. And then we put all that together into this is how it could work. And so we learned from others. We looked at other examples. And we put together that black book you talked about that had detailed budgets, detailed plans, detailed everything. And to be honest, it's remarkable to me that it all worked out. Because if you look at it, for the budget, because we, we basically had to make it up. I mean, we didn't know. I mean, how would you know how to scale something like that? How would you know what the cost per patient would be when you were taking these estimates? How would you possibly divide all that up? And we were, we were off by 50% on the number of people who were actually HIV positive because we had to adjust the numbers because we were going off PMTCT programs. And so how that all worked out, I have no idea. But somehow, <laughs> after five years, what we said would happen with the budget happened. Um, and that changed everything. And that's the other thing I would just point out. Before PEPFAR, everyone talks about results-based financing, right? Before PEPFAR, um, the notion that you would set goals and hold people accountable in development was unheard of. So if you asked anyone, what are you doing in antiretroviral therapy? What are you doing in HIV prevention? What are you doing in orphan care? What are you doing in malaria? What are you doing in food programs? The answer would have been, we are spending X amount of money. That would have been it. We're spending this. Because that, that's all anyone tracked. That's all anyone thought about. That's all anyone cared about. And there are reasons for that that we could talk about, which have to do with post-colonialism and guilt and a whole bunch of other stuff. But that's all anyone, and the Cold War, but that's all anyone cared about. The notion that you would say, 
this amount of money is going to go for these countries to do this and achieve these results, and we're going to check twice a year, and we're going to report on it, and we're going to correct it when there's unheard of. And I would point out that some of the public health experts virulently criticized us and said, you can't set goals like that. It's too complicated. You know, you just have to dedicate money and see what happens. Now everyone talks about results-based financing. Um, and that was a huge, huge shift in how we, and President Kagame, and this is how I'll end because it relates to the paternalistic, President Kagame in Rwanda said something that I'll never forget in the early days of PEPFAR. He said, you know, this is the first time someone's held a, held, someone has respected us enough to hold us accountable. It's quite a statement, quite a statement. Let me ask about the controversy from that time. So how valid are the criticisms of AB in the ABC approach that you sometimes hear? And what is the role of behavior change in, in uh, approaching the um, AIDS pandemic? You should probably ask Kathy. But um, you know, the, the criticisms are valid because the, um, the science isn't there in the way we normally do science. So our, you know, our gold standard in science is randomized controlled trials. You actually can't do a behavioral randomized controlled trial very well in something like HIV because you can't control for things. I mean, you literally need millions and millions of people, and you can almost never control for it. Um, people in smoking have kind of figured this out. They actually have an in-between between randomized controlled trials and kind of qualitative iffy studies. There actually is science there, but we've never really applied it in HIV very well. But the studies that have been done haven't shown an impact, and I'm not surprised because of the way they were conducted because it's the only way you could conduct them. I don't think we actually know the answer to uh, behavior change related to HIV and does it make a difference. We do know the age of sexual debut has shifted by a year or so in many countries. We do know that there, in the early days when you could actually trust surveys, which we can't trust anymore because people learn the answers they were supposed to give. Um, but the early surveys showed that wherever we saw declining infection rates, we saw a decrease in number of casual partners, uh, uh, in particular, increased use of condoms in casual partnerships, rarely in regular partnerships, um, at least among young men, and that we could correlate uh, behavior change. But what caused that behavior? Was it seeing their friends die? Was it the money we were spending in the programs? We don't, we don't have the studies to show that. So a lot of what we do in public health is actually art. It's taking science, trying to be reasonable, doing the best you can, and combining data with an interpretation. And our, it's our art. You're trying to do the best you can with the data you have available. If you actually stuck to randomized controlled trials on the gold standard, we'd be doing almost <laughs> nothing in medicine and public health. And public health really is a, an adaptation. So I don't think we know the answer to what was the impact of these programs. Um, uh, and I think we need a much better understanding about that. We were just talking about how we could do some things around adolescent girls and young women. We know things change. We know it was done. We know that there was an impact. But we, don't, we can't answer that question. But the criticisms are valid to the extent that we don't have trials. We can't prove it. Um, but there's something in there that I think gives us enough comfort to do things um, in smart ways. It was, it was interesting to me, Mark, that uh, when we went into a variety of settings, the B part, the be faithful, was often in African terms viewed as a women's issue yeah. because it was men with multiple concurrent partners who were bringing uh, you know, AIDS and infecting their wives. And it was kind of a feminist issue in yeah. the way that was perceived. It was not perceived that way in the West yeah. often. Um, yeah. It was interesting. Before we move on, because I want to talk about the future, uh, can you talk a little bit about the evolution of PEPFAR from being an emergency program to uh, becoming more oriented towards uh, sustainability, local mm -hmm. capacity? I know some of that happened in the context of the, uh, uh, when the legislation was renewed for PEPFAR. Yeah. Um, but you took over, and one of your challenges was really to take a program that had been an emergency program and turn it into something more sustainable. How did that happen? So this is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, actually. Um, it was always a sustainable program. And in fact, if you go back and look at the, that little black book, that was very prominent in the book. And why was it? Because it, it had to be, because this is a chronic disease. And that is one of the things that I think 
when all is said and done, when HIV is done, in 50 years when people look back, one of the legacies, one of the greatest legacies of PEPFAR will be, and the response to AIDS more broadly, is it's the first time in the history of development and global health, and actually the term global health didn't even exist then, right? I mean, <laughs> it's come, it, all of this has to do with the creation of even the, the, the term or students that study global health. Um, it's the first time we invested in chronic care and a chronic disease. So we've done vaccines, we've done one-off things, we've done things like TB, which is a little bit longer, it's six months, but we never were willing to invest in chronic care. And that was the antiretroviral therapy is too complicated in Africa. There was no sense of building a chronic delivery system. And so to do treatment, you actually need a sustainable health system. You can't do it without having doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals, community workers, logistic systems, supply systems, communication systems, training systems. You can't do it. And also HIV prevention is chronic. That's a, it's like smoking and diabetes, right? People are at risk for HIV in different ways at different times for 40 to 50 years. It's chronic prevention. It's chronic delivery. It's chronic everything. And you can't do that unless you build a system. So the notion, this whole system versus vertical, this, it's just nonsense to me. There are, there are realities there, and we have to be careful not to uh, be too broad, one, two broad strokes one way or the other. But unlike other diseases, you can't do HIV without doing a system. Now, the other sustainability is there's programmatic sustainability, there's financial sustainability. Those pieces are really difficult, and that has to do with the future. And we are not, we are not doing as a global community systems uh, in the way that we need to for real transition, but that we can save probably for where we're going for the future. Um, but I don't want to imply that there wasn't a sense of we just need to go, and you know, we funded a lot of international organizations, and you know, over time that has to stop, and we did, we shifted, we, we forced international organizations to turn over to local organizations, which was a massive fight within the US government. It's the nice thing about the Global Fund, we actually do just fund local systems for the most part. Um, but there are things in there, and there, was a, there is a debate there, but there isn't a debate of this was all emergency with no sense of sustainability, and then we kind of shifted to sustainability. It was a natural evolution because of the nature of the disease. That brings us to the Global Fund. So maybe you can talk just a little in a basic way about the division of labor between PEPFAR and the Global Fund. How do they relate to one another? And it's not just PEPFAR, actually, it's national programs. One thing people should understand, this relates to sustainability, is now more than 50% of the financing for the HIV response from the countries, come from the countries themselves. Uh, it comes from lower and middle income countries, 50%. You know, the notion that it's all coming externally is just not true. It was true 15 years ago, it's not today. Now a lot of that's middle income country money, but even low income countries have increased by 150% the amount of financing they're putting for HIV. So, um, uh, the Global Fund is a very different instrument uh, than PEPFAR, which is a bilateral program, and it's been fascinating being part of the Global Fund, uh, and which we've been, you know, really since the beginning, uh, because it was created about the same time, and President Bush gave the first gift, the first second gift, largest contributor, the, the American people are largest contributor to the fund as well. But it's a multilateral institution, it's a very different animal. And we fundamentally support country programs that are managed by governments and local organizations, which is very different than a bilateral mechanism, which fundamentally is funding international organizations to do programming in countries. There's some funding of the local government, and from a long-term perspective, that's not a very good strategy, right? From a long-term perspective, transition country ownership funding international organizations at you know, $5 billion a year is probably not gonna get you there. Um, so it's a very big difference. The other difference is we're not a technical agency. I mean, we have two advisors. Well, until this recent shift, we had two HIV advisors, <laughs> technical advisors. Uh, we were built as a partnership, which, which is great. It's challenging, but it's great. So the, the whole idea, and for those of you who have ever been in a country, the mess a country faces from investments in HIV or anything in development is almost mind-boggling. I mean, you have... Ten years ago, governments had no idea what the U.S. government was investing in in their countries, in HIV, and food aid, and anything. They had no idea. 
different agencies in the US government working in the same county had no idea what the other agency was doing. And then you've got all the other UN agencies, and you've got everyone, it's a mess. And how is a government gonna, how is a country gonna actually own something like that? So the fund was actually created to try to pull all that together and actually support the country to achieve its objectives so that they owned it and carried it forward and that you could have a successful transition. We didn't deliver very well on that for the first 10 years, to be honest. I mean, we, we did a lot of good, but that's not one thing we did. We, we basically set ourselves up to be yet another independent agency that ignored everyone else and threw elbows around and talked about how great we were as the Global Fund. You know, now we, I barely ever talk about the Global Fund anymore. I talk about the country and the people who make us possible and the mechanism that we are, that people use. We're a mechanism, a partnership mechanism that people use, uh, whether you're a fund, funder or a technical partner or the country itself. So it's a very different animal. Um, and I think really the right animal, um, bi big bilaterals, uh, are problematic, to be honest. Um, multilaterals that are, if they're done well, which unfortunately they rarely are, uh, is, is the right way to do it, and a partnership is the right way to do it, and a focus on the country and their systems is the right way to do it. And the other difficult thing, and uh, it used to annoy me beyond belief, so when I, when I was at PEPFAR, you know, I'd go to countries and there'd be big events to talk about stuff with the head of state, and the head of state would be talking about the Global Fund this, the Global Fund that, the Global I was, I would just get so mad. I'd be like, we're putting 10 times as much money in here. Why on earth are you talking about that organization? And the reason was because they felt like the Global Fund was theirs. Yeah. Uh, they never felt like PEPFAR was. They love PEPFAR. They really do. I, mean, I can't tell you how thankful the African people are, from heads of state to people in the village for PEPFAR. It changed everything. The Global Fund contributed, but it changed everything. The Global Fund's done more on TB and malaria, but on HIV, it, PEPFAR really drove everything. Um, but the Global Fund is theirs. And bilateral programs will always be attached to the government across the ocean. So there's always a, you know, what do they really want from this? That's an American program. You know, is it, well, how does that play in? You got the ambassador coming in talking about it. There's always a taint to it, uh, as opposed to, you know, everyone's in it together in global solidarity. Um, and we also have civil society in a massive way. So it is the right model for development. The key is making it work. And that's, the, that's not so easy. Let me go into a, a little more technical element of this. How is new data, better data, and proven prevention technologies transforming the fight against AIDS as kind of next step? So data, data is everything, right? I mean, otherwise you're, you're not having impact. And that was one of the, again, one of the huge shifts away from how much money you're spending to what impact are you having with the money that you have. But a big difference is 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you could spend money on anything and have an impact uh, because there's just need all over the place. Now you have to be really smart. And there isn't a lot of new money, but you have to be really smart in how you use the funds to have an impact. Because the easy stuff's been done. All the, you know, the building out of the clinics that were there, reaching the people who are going to come to clinics, it's all been done. So now we're down to the really, really tough stuff. And you can only do that with data. So let me just tell you some data that scares me, but is also interesting. Um, most countries now in Africa, we, you know, we, chances are we never really had broad, generalized epidemics. We always had focal micro-epidemics. We definitely have focal micro epidemics today, multiple epidemics. So just take Kenya for an example. They basically have three really uh, significant micro epidemics, one in the east, one in the west, and one in the center in Nairobi. And they're very different epidemics. One dri is driven by MSM predominantly, uh, but also a little bit more by drug use. One is a mix of MSM uh, drug use and heterosexual, and one is almost entirely heterosexual. Three very different epidemics in different parts of the country. We didn't know that. I mean, we didn't know any of that stuff ten years ago. All we had was general pre uh, uh, prevalence data. So you have to be really smart, and you have to pick the interventions that work, and you have to focus your resources, and you have to go where the new infections are. That's that's basic public health. But that's in tension with the politics of countries that are divided ethnically, and they have to make, give resources all over. So it gets really complicated. But they also have to pick the interventions that work, not just the places that they're going to work. But the one that really scares me is adolescent girls and young women. So if you look in southern Africa, 
uh, which is where you know, the vast majority of the epidemic in the world is today, southern Africa. Uh, we are, and the, for the first time since we've all been doing this, I am actually afraid we're going to lose control of the epidemic. And I think we're going to win some battles, like increased number of people in treatment a lot, but we're going to lose the war if we don't focus on adolescent girls and young women. So let me just tell you really frightening numbers. So we have, in 15 years of intensive work and really good progress, an overall 30% reduction in infections in Africa, among adolescent girls and young women, which is 15 to 24, we have barely moved the dial at all. Uh, no change at all. Now we have data to tell us that. So we've not done much. If we reduced infections by 50% in adolescent girls and young women, we would still have a growing epidemic because of the youth bulge, because reproductivity rates are so high that there are so many young people entering the reproductive pool, the sexually active pool, so many young women entering the pool, that even if we cut the rates in half, which we've, we haven't done anything in, in the last 15 years, we would see a growing epidemic. And this is why AIDS is such an interesting disease, because it is a social, social disease. It is not just a medical disease. It is highly social. And the way adolescent girls and young women are treated, transactional sex, uh, girls out of school are huge risk. We're actually investing as an institution in keeping girls in school, cash incentives to keep girls in school, because it's been shown to reduce HIV rates. But I can, if we don't get hold of this, and but if you refine the data even further, so go to Kuala Zulu Natal, where we have the high, some of the highest rates of transmission in adolescent girls and young women. You can go within a 10 kilometer radius difference and have a tenfold different rate of, of, new, of new infections. So, you know, if you're going to control an epidemic, you go where the new infections are. But it gets really complicated because we're using genetic data that show that boys in school, they're getting infected within their peer environment. Girls in school are not. The genetics tell us that they're not getting infected by their peer group, which means they're getting infected by someone outside of their community, which means it's probably a truck driver or a fisherman or someone that they're engaging not in sex work in the way we think, but in transactional sex. And sometimes they're engaging in transactional sex because their family makes them engage in transactional sex and pulls them out of school because they're the girl and they're not important to the family except for getting them food and getting them other stuff. So it's a very complex social dynamic. And if we don't get a handle on all this and if we don't change, so that's where data become important. You go from looking at national prevalence rates to individual rates to incident rates to who's the population and what are the drivers of those epidemics and only then will we get to figuring out how to control the epidemic. That's true for malaria, by the way. It's true for tuberculosis. Let me give you an example of tuberculosis. A third of all new tuberculosis cases in southern Africa are from migratory mine workers. It's not the mine workers' fault. Um, it's they're in a mine in a country, and when they're in the mine, they get diagnosed and treated because they don't want people spreading TB in the mines. But then they go home to their family, and they stop the drug. And then they get the TB back, and then they cough in their community, and everyone in the community gets TB, and we know that. And then they go to another mine in another country, and they start a different drug regimen because you don't have a line regulatory authority. And then they start the drugs in the mine again. And then they go again, and they probably go to another family because they have multiple families because of the way that societal piece works. And then they go to another country. So, and we have no way to track them. And we have no standardized regulatory authority. And we have no standardized regimens. And we have nothing that will help us prevent that today. So that's a data-driven response. Same in malaria. We have pockets of malaria. We have pockets of subclinical malaria that we know of now that we can go in and really beat up on. But data drive everything. Let's expand it out a little bit because the Global Fund does do um, malaria and tuberculosis as well. How do you see the, our window of opportunity right now on those other diseases? What can we accomplish or what are the risks right now for those other diseases? Yeah. So, you know, as we talked about, I went into medicine because of HIV and I'm pretty committed on it. But TB and malaria really ticked me off. Uh, you know, so TB has curative therapy in six months. Malaria has curative therapy in three days. Only human hosts. And if there's no malaria in a human being, you can't actually, a mosquito can't transmit it. So three-day curative therapy, six-month curative therapy. Can you imagine if we had three-day curative therapy for HIV? or six-month curative therapy for HIV. I think we'd be tolerating the per persistence right. of these diseases. Yeah. Absolutely not, absolutely not. 
It's appalling. It's appalling <laughs> that we still have these diseases. And we know because we don't have them in our country, except for people who, imp except for imported cases, right? So, and it's really frustrating. So in TB, 80% of TB exists in the BRICS. Does everyone know what the BRICS are? So upper middle income countries. We don't invest that much. I mean, we're the largest external funder of TB, but we're 20% of the funding for TB. The vast majority of TB financing comes from middle income countries because that's where all the TB is. China, India. India and China account for, I think, 50% on its own. Right? So if they don't respond, and, and they have antiquated, terrible systems, you know, the, the a, TB and HIV actually are increasing dramatically in Eastern Europe because they, they, and who gets TB? Poor people, prisoners, and people inject drugs. And those societies don't care about them and don't try to reach them. Um, so it's, it's just ridiculous that we still have TB. Uh, malaria, you know. Now malaria is more complicated because there are issues related to drainage and water and it gets a little more complicated, but still. There's only one host, us. There's only one, one group that carries. So if you can actually stamp out, you can have all the mosquitoes you want, but if you get rid of malaria for a while, it doesn't matter how many mosquitoes are around because there's no malaria to transmit. So, and we've not been smart in either of those fields of using money in the most effective way to get to epidemic control. And it gets back to the problem we first started. In HIV, TB, and malaria, we are still thinking the way we thought 15 years ago. Money, big interventions, follow things we used to follow. Number of people in treatment, number of doses of malaria drugs given, uh, number of people reached by TB programs, our goal is not to end the epidemics. Right. And so we don't have the vision of, if our goal is ending an epidemic, what are you going to do in that country? Our goal is, let's put some money, let's do some programs, let's do what we can. It's not ending an epidemic, going where the epidemic is, being smart about the interventions, being smart about how we do things. And so I would just combine that with what we talked about in terms of evidence. So does any, how, does any of you know how many infectious diseases have ever been, have been eradicated in the world? What are they? Exactly, smallpox and rinderpest. God, someone knows what rinderpest is. Rinderpest is a zoonotic disease. So if you look at rinderpest, now admittedly there are vaccines for these. If you look at rinderpest and, and smallpox, and you talk with the people, and if any, for those of you interested, obviously you all are because you're here, uh, I would strongly recommend Bill Faggy's House on Fire. It's 100 pages, you can read it in two days. Um, don't tell Bill I said that, but you can read it in two days. It's a brilliant book because it really goes into the social aspects of, of trying to end epidemics. And what, what we're talking about is what the problem was in smallpox and rinderpest. There wasn't a shift towards ending epidemics as your goal. It was coverage rates. Um, and so we had coverage rates that were going up and up and up for rinderpest and smallpox, but the epidemics were actually going up. And then with something like a 6 or 10% increase in coverage rates, the epidemics ended because they focused where new infections were. And that was hugely controversial, hugely controversial. The countries just wanted to do national coverage campaigns, national campaigns, same with Rinderpest. They just wanted to cover the cows. It wasn't focused on if you're going to end an epidemic, what would you do? And it led to so many changes. It changed, it, it involved culture and local stuff. And, and, but we haven't changed our mindset. Uh, polio is actually doing it right now. We haven't changed our mindset in malaria and TB and HIV to coverage, increase, shiny new objects, silver bullets, to if we're going to end an epidemic, how are you going to do it? It raises a kind of uncomfortable question. Has the focus and attention and resources on HIV AIDS been disproportionate? Um, how long will the global community uh, give such a priority to AIDS? I'm just interested in well, it's already shifted. Right. It's already shifted. You know, the only large bilateral donor that focuses on AIDS anymore is the globe, is the U U.S. DFID pretty, the U.K. pretty much has closed down its um, HIV shop. They're focused on malaria and gender issues, so they're related. S the Nordic countries interested, but shifting pretty significantly towards health systems. J Japan shifted a long time ago. The European Commission has shifted. So, you know, the big funders, basically if the U.S., the global fund would cease to exist if the U.S. lost interest in HIV because of the third, the global fund basically drives other 
donors, the U.S. contribution drives other donors. Yeah. If the U.S. collapsed in HIV, the, the, the global financing for HIV would pretty much cease to exist on, on any large scale. So you can all be very proud and call your members of Congress and tell them to keep doing it because if you don't, uh, the global effort really collapses. So it's already happened. Um, there are still pockets of strong advocacy, and that's why we still exist. You know, there are very strong advocacy groups in, in parts of Europe and other places that keep people going, which we don't actually have in TB and, and malaria to the same extent. So the shift has already happened. Um, and that's, that, that's, that's actually a natural thing that does happen. Now, has HIV received more than its fair share? I find that hard. Now, I'm incredibly biased. Um, but, so when malaria existed, when sanitation existed, when chronic diseases existed, all these things, um, HIV in the hardest hit countries cut life expectancy in half. So with all those other problems, life expectancy was moving up to 55, 60 years. HIV within three to five years is back down to 35. The second thing about HIV, which is a very unique disease, any death is terrible, right? Well, not really, we're all gonna die, right? So death is okay, it's just uh, how we do it. It's more than okay, it can be very beautiful. Um, but if you die very young and very old, your impact on society is actually significantly different. Your impact on your family, and you know, that's significant, but on society, it's, it's not as impactful. HIV kills 15 to 49-year-olds, and especially 15 to 35-year-olds, disproportionately, hugely, actually. So it was knocking out the productive and reproductive parts of society. And the other myth about HIV is it, is it preys on the poorest of the poor. It actually doesn't. TB does. Uh, HIV does not. It actually preys on people who have just come above the poorest of the poor. And it was preferentially, still is, preferentially killing teachers, healthcare workers, uh, and people with jobs. And some of that's societal. They had a little bit of extra money, they had multiple homes, they had multiple wives, they would move around. Um, but if you're killing all your teachers, if you're killing all your healthcare workers, and you're killing all your factory and employee workers, well, how on earth are you gonna have economic development? It's impossible. So the impact of HIV was more than the numbers, and it was more, it was, it was who was dying, not just the numbers that were dying. So I don't know, was it disproportionate? Maybe, um, but I don't think so. What do you think will be the um, top health priorities 10 years from now? Just looking forward, what are we gonna face 10 years from now? Well, it might be different what we face and who's gonna pay for them. Um, so, Non-communicable diseases are on the rise, diabetes, hypertension, and those are also very upsetting because it's really easy to diagnose, and at least for simple drugs, it's you know, 10 cents for an antihypertensive uh, diuretic, it's 10 cents in generics, it's 10 cents for um, uh, good control and, and prevention. So we're gonna face those non-communicable diseases more. Um, cervical cancer is actually now killing more women uh, than are dying in childbirth, which is appalling because no one, no woman should die from cervical cancer. It's so easy to diagnose and treat, and a lot of it's related to HIV anyway in Africa. And we're seeing, we're actually seeing 15-year-olds die from cervical cancer in Africa. We don't even start testing for you men uh, until you're 40 uh, in the United States, and we're seeing 15-year-old die, 15 years, 15-year-olds die because of HIV. So cancer is growing too, but again, these are diseases that kill older. The the big difference is going to be who pays for this stuff, right? So because of economic growth, you know, countries are growing. If you look at the numbers over this next 15-year period, from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals, which is an awful name, right? Sustainable Development Isn't that exciting? Sustainable <laughs> Development Goals. Uh, Richard Curtis, who does communication, said the only worse term than Millennium Development Goals is Sustainable Development Goals. <laughs> so, of course, we're going to take it, right? That'll galvanize the world, Sustainable Development Goals. So, um, during that period, all but about 15 countries will move into middle income status. Um, and those 15 countries are challenging operating environments. It's not a one-way street. You know, countries make progress. Cote d'Ivoire 20 years ago was actually the shining light of West Africa, in fact, of all Africa, and then they had a civil war, and they went backwards. So, you know, and with Ebola, countries go forward and go backward. Sierra Leone's economies collapse. Liberia's economies collapse. So countries go, but there'll basically be 15 countries where there's significant external, 15 to 20 countries where there's significant external financing for large programming. 
Um, the rest is going to be the country's responsibility. And, and who's going to pay for all these things is really a complicated issue. So one of the things I think a lot of us are focused on now is how do we support countries to build the resilient and sustainable systems and what are those component pieces that need to be in place? Not all the bells and whistles, but what are the things that need to be in place? And one of the things we're very focused on are uh, data management systems and quality of programs, which is actually where Europe's gone around healthcare. We're using a lot of the same models as we're thinking about this. And you know, the response to Ebola is all based on surveillance. You know, build a surveillance system, you know, which means reporting data up. We knew the number of cases of Ebola in March. It wasn't because we didn't know them. It was because no one did anything about it. Uh, so if, but if you build a data management system down to a community healthcare worker so that they look at data and use it, and then report it as necessary, then you change the response. And actually, that probably solved Ebola. And that also means seeing a health system as going beyond a clinic. So a, a Minister of Health, actually former Minister of Health, which is probably why you could say it, uh, <laughs> recent of a very large African country said, well, it was publicly, of, of Nigeria, said, look, I wasn't a Minister of Health. I was a Minister of Public Hospitals. And that's the reality, because if you see health as ending in a clinic, you're never going to have health. You're going to have sick people who get services, but you're not going to have health. Health goes into the community where prevention occurs, where identifying and getting to the marginalized who are most at risk. That's all in the community. So if we see a health system as ending there, and we build our data and surveillance system as ending there, and we don't go into the community, we're, we're in trouble. And so I think the challenge of the next 10 years is to really work with countries to build, and actually their instinct is right. They know all this. We're the ones who have forced them into other stuff. Um, and Rwanda and Ethiopia and others were smart enough to use the money we gave them to do all that. Uh, if we support them that way, then how this transition occurs will be much better. But I do think the, the most important thing there is the health issues will be different, but we're not going to be talking about them in global health. It's going to be country health, because what we'll be doing is fundamentally different than what we do today. Now, we're going to take a couple of questions, so be thinking about it. But I want to close with one question in particular. What would you tell uh, students who are thinking about a career in global health? What advice would you give them now? Get an MBA. <laughs> now, um, so two things. One, um, I don't believe in advice. Um, because advice is what, what you would do, what I would do if I were you, right? Uh, I, you can give information, you can give experience, but advice is telling someone what you would do if you were them, and you're not. Uh, so I'm not big on advice. Um, uh, the, one, the one piece I would give you as students, actually, uh, is if you're doing in 10 years what you think you're gonna, you want to be doing today, you screwed up. Um, because you, you, didn't wa you didn't see opportunities flying at you all the time and new things. Like the last thing on earth I thought I would ever be doing <laughs> is uh, what I'm doing today, or PEPFAR, or, or for that matter, as I talked about, you know, being a scientist in the first place. Uh, so opportunities will come all over the place. So I don't know what your careers are going to look like in 10 years because of where the field is going to go. But it's not going to be I'm a highly technical person, you know, and that's what I need to be. It's a broader perspective of where the world's going, what public health looks like, how societies develop, how pieces fit together, how you effectively use money, not just how much money is available, use of data in a smart way that will make a difference. Um, it's a very different thing. Do questions. Um, so the most important thing in all that is do what you love. You know, don't follow trends, because I can tell you they're going to be different in two years than you think they are today, or three years. And if you're doing something because you think there'll be a job, or you think it'll be, you know, you think it's the thing to do because everyone's telling you it's the thing to do or because people are advising you to do it, you're going to be unhappy. If you do what you want to do, if you follow your heart, if you, uh, if you focus on the things that excite you, you're going to be good at what you do yeah. and you're going to be happy. Those are pretty important things. So um, anyone who says this is the trend in global health, so get on that bandwagon, stop listening to them because they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, and they're giving you bad advice. So I don't, uh, you know, my answer would be uh, focus on what excites you uh, and be open to and curious about what else is out there. And then you'll do really well and be really happy. Great advice. <laughs> Thank you.
So you, you've heard a, an incredible spectrum of someone's life and future life, and uh, we have, we'll take 10, 15 minutes for any, uh, any questions that you want to throw at either one of these individuals. I'm just going to call on you and just say who you are, if you don't mind, and who you want to answer the question. There's a mic right behind you. In fact, there's a mic there and there's a mic upstairs. If you want to get online, that would be fine. So again, I'm Catherine Adme, and I'm affiliated faculty with the Duke Global Health Institute, and I'm here on the faculty at the Stanford School. So, Mike, I'm actually working on an article right now, and I need your help, seriously, <laughs> all right? And the question is about TB, and whether or not our vision ought to understand that when we're trying to stop an epidemic, we should try just as hard to stop an epidemic in a country of low income as we would in a country of high income. You know I'm a lawyer, right? So we have this idea that global health is actually dependent on the economic development of their country and that you can have a different plan for countries of a low income setting than for countries that aren't. I'm wondering as you think about and you push us to have a vision, do you think that vision should be that we stamp out epidemics in every country at TB epidemic just as much in KwaZulu-Natal as we would in, let's say, Kentucky? Was that to me? Uh, I think to Mark. To Mark? Yeah. Sorry. Um, well, Mike can write about it and probably have a lot more impact than I would. Um, so yeah, and actually that's the, that's the general theme of the sustainable development goals, that it's not just low-income countries, not just developing countries, which is a terrible word too, it's actually everyone. So the, the SDGs are actually, and the health, and all of them are meant for everyone, including high-income countries. Um, and TB in Appalachia has got a big problem, and we actually have problems, as you know, in some of our inner cities, because that's where poor people live, and when there's TB there, it spreads. From a development perspective, um, and this, uh, this is a really important, was an important lesson for me, is most money for all this stuff doesn't come from health people, it, it, or a health perspective. It does in the US because of the nature of PEPFAR and, and PMI, the President's Malaria Initiative. But for most countries, it comes out of development budgets. And from their perspective, once a country reaches a certain economic status, yeah, there's inequality, but they have inequality at home. And you know, a reasonable thing for a senator from Kentucky would be to say, I got TB here. Why am I sticking money over there when they, have a, when they actually have resource, they're just not putting it in the right place? And that's the complicated thing that we're all going to have to struggle with. And, you know, India is a big one. You know, it's really hard to convince people. DFID, the UK government, stepped out of India. Imagine how difficult that was. Um, and so it's really hard to say, so we're going to go spend a lot of money in India. But there are things you can do from a policy perspective, from a catalytic perspective, you know, change the approach, focus on what's going to have an impact. And, and those countries, like India is a great example, they hate when you come in and tell them you have to do this because I have some money. They're very open to, hey, let's talk, what is your experience? What are you learning? Here's what we learned. How can we work together? And there's going to be a real shift in all of this from the paternalistic, I have some money to fund some programs, to let's talk and exchange public goods. And I think the same could be true in, say, Kentucky. But there's going to be the shift. So whether it's Kentucky or, or Delhi, um, there's going to be a shift. And, and, and understanding the development lens is important. And, but it is a global public good to stop TB, but it's really complicated. So it, I'm, I'm Mike, I don't know either of your perspective, but this is a, I think TB is a great example of, of could be the forward edge of how we do things differently, and maybe you can solve that problem. <laughs> All right, thank you. That'd be great. Just step up to the mic. Hi, my name's Manshi. I'm an MBP student at Sanford. Uh, my question policy. is to Mark. Uh, so you did speak about uh, data and gave us really good insights to how data can help us deep, you know, go deeper into the issues. But when we're talking about developing countries, what are the challenges you, you feel? And, or maybe you know, the growth in how data collection has grown. And is it, is it at a stage where we can uh, you know, be fine with it and it, okay, you can use it perhaps. Mm -hmm. So what, what, were you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, 
I, I, there's a huge range. So some countries are doing extremely well and some are not. And there's, a, there's a range in what you want to do and how you want to do it based on what you have. You know, going for the gold standard everywhere is probably not going to be helpful. One of the most amazing things to me is, you know, we have this assumption that in the U.S. we have these great data and we know what we're doing. And we just, that's nonsense. You know, we just had to revise down upward our estimate of the number of HIV-infected people in the United States by 20% for the last 10 years because we, our reporting was so bad. You know, we don't do a very good job. Of, the only company, the only way we know data half the time is from pharmaceutical companies who can tell us how many drugs they bought, right? So, but some countries are doing a very good job, and we do have an opportunity, and what we're seeing is really exciting, to leapfrog kind of paper-based systems, uh, to move towards a much more sophisticated system. But we've also done really stupid things, like set up 15 of them in the same country instead of trying to build one national system that will cover all diseases. And now we're getting better at that. And we hope that in the next five years we'll have a real focus on supporting smart data management systems for, for what's necessary, not gold standard stuff. Mm -hmm. And we can jump over it because they don't have those systems to start with. So, um, you know, there's a reason your cell phone drops 15 times when you take the train from D.C. to New York. And it's because we retrofitted systems into bad systems and that's always harder and more expensive. If you can jump over it, uh, which is why cell phones work really well in villages in Africa, then you can do it. So, it, but we're not doing a smart job of this now. We're totally discoordinated, and we're all trying to set up our own systems, and the countries, that's a mess there. If we actually focused on what you're talking, which is why we're not focused on data management systems, I think there's a massive opportunity to build real systems that would pro be the basis of healthcare, and we hope there'll be more emphasis on it. I hope some of you have an interest in that, because that, I think, is a huge future for us, although I could be wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Chrissy. I'm a DJHI alum, as well as currently working with UNAIDS on human rights issues. Thank you very much for coming to speak with us today. I think it was really informative for a lot of us in the room. Um, I have kind of a controversial, maybe, uh, statement in question. Uh, you mentioned as you were talking about how why HIV was really an emergency situation and important so much because of who it was affecting or is affecting in terms of the age range of um, most commonly the people affected and dying and that uh, occupation that we lost the generation of teachers and health workers and parents, et cetera, et cetera. So my question is, um, with UNAIDS right now, they've identified key population groups that are underserved and are the reason why, uh, the, that are being left behind and the reason why HIV is continuing. How do we keep going and keep funding and have any opportunity to end an epidemic that's no longer targeting people that are of importance, that are targeting injecting drug users, transactional sex people, um, even young girls to a certain extent, but M MSM. Uh, what, what do we do now if it's people that no one cares about? It's a great question. I just came from the uh, regional meeting of uh, European countries of WHO. And this is the fundamental problem why TB and HIV are increasing in that region, because it's people who inject drugs, prisoners, uh, some MSM, but it's really people inject drug and prisoners. And they, a lot of the countries just don't care. They actually, well, they'd be fine if they all died. They don't care. Um, uh, and then you have, and one group you didn't mention is trans, pe transgender people, which is a, a frightening, frightening epidemic uh, and is linked to sex work and abuse and it's, it's just horrific. Um, the thing is, and this is why it's complicated, is while the rates of HIV are very high in those groups, as a part of the population, as you point out, it's a very small part of the population. So you actually have ended an epidemic in almost any, almost any definition when all you have left are those really small pockets, even when you have high rates. You haven't eliminated the infection, but you've ended it as an epidemic or public health threat. And how you stay focused on that is extremely, extremely difficult. But there's great opportunity and success that we're seeing in some places. So Honduras and El Salvador, I was just in Honduras. Jamaica on LGBTI issues, 
looks completely different than it did five years ago. You know, the government's actively working with community organizations of the LGBTI community. We're actually working with them on transition, and we stopped all of our financing in countries like that for programs, for PMTCP programs, grants. All we fund now, and UNAIDS has been hugely important in this. Michelle C.D. Bay is awesome on these issues. And to be honest, having an openly gay head of a multilateral, I think I'm the only one to ever be an openly gay uh, head of a, a multilateral organization. But for me to go and talk to leaders about this is a little difficult. When you have a West African male going and talking about it, it's very different. He's been hugely impactful. But we've seen sh these shifts. So we make an assumption that these shifts won't happen, but we're seeing them. Um, and uh, Kofi Annan said something to me recently when we were talking about a very similar, this issue actually, in Africa. And he said, you know, you push and you push and you push, and all of a sudden it changes. And you look back and say, well, of course it changed. But you have no idea why. You have no idea what happened. You know, gay marriage in this country is a great example. So I am actually very hopeful we're going to see that kind of shifts. And HIV is the reason we have gay rights in this country as far as I'm concerned. That's not true in the Nordic countries, but it's true here. I actually told President Obama that, and he kind of agreed with me. Um, um, and HIV is still a driver for changing perceptions and thoughts about this. But so is public outrage, which is much easier around gay issues than, than, and transgender, actually, than around people who inject drugs and prisoners, which gets really complicated. So there's no good answer except that it's, we're seeing things work. We're trying to understand why. We're also shifting, as I mentioned, and we want in our next strategy to completely shift how we do things and really only focus on human rights issues in upper middle income countries. And, and, and that's all we're going to invest in. And we're actually working on, this would be a great thing for you, someone to think about, how do you measure progress? It's one thing in Honduras when all of a sudden they decide, all right, we want to work with them. How do you measure progress in, say, uh, I don't want to pick a country publicly, but say, in a country that really is showing no interest? And you can, right? You don't go from zero to 100. You see changes happening. What are those changes? How do we measure them? Even qualitatively, how do we measure them? How can we say we're making progress? Because then people will invest. And here's the difference with HIV, I think, than something like vaccination, which is a human rights issue, but it's, you know, the donors who want us to be funding mostly in low-income countries, because that's where disease burden is, and that's where development money belongs, also have very strong positions on civil society and human rights. And so I, what we are working on is what we call the development continuum. How you, you, uh, how you invest in what you invest in is very different in a challenging operating environment in a low-middle-income country and an upper-middle-income country where all you have left is these key affected populations. And we make that case and make it smartly with data and with indicators, I think we can get there. But it's a great question. Um, uh, and, and we all need to work on it. Uh, because it's a really challenging issue. I have one <clears throat> question also for both of you. Um, <clears throat> many people this evening are watching their television because there's a, a debate going on, uh, 11 candidates for president of one of the parties. And I, I was uh, touched by your comment how much the U.S. is now the leading funder by far for AIDS, um, whether it be the Global Fund or PEPFAR. So I'm wondering in the, you know, how you see the outcome of the election, whether it, <clears throat> on either side, I don't mean to, for you to pick a party, but you know, we're, uh, certainly you indicated President Obama pretty much with regard to AIDS, I'm not saying there were no changes, but, but pretty much continued the, the Bush policy. I'm just wondering how you both see the future with regard to the American government's ability, willingness to continue to provide the kind of support that you mentioned is still going on, whoever wins. I mean, I don't mean to ask you to say it's good if one or bad for the other, but just any reflections you have on that in case it affects how any of the people here might vote. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, why don't you start? Yeah, I would only... I would start by saying that it's not a good thing for development and global health if Republican ideology is, is defined by the resentment of outsiders. That would be a very bad thing. Um, I, Donald Trump has not talked very much about development or about any real issue, actually, um, <laughs> but, uh, and may not be capable of it, but he, um, he has uh, shaped a form of conservative populism that is uh, based on 
uh, the fear and resentment of outsiders, whether it's immigrants, whether it's Chinese economic competition, whether it's Mexico as the great evil power that's, you know. And export, it, it, Right, exactly. Um, these are, uh, uh, you know, Republicans right now are very, in a very sober fashion, are trying to determine whether this is a transient phenomenon like we saw in the last election or whether this is a deep uh, growing tendency. Um, and that, that would be, I think, very bad for development. We have seen a situation where there has been a lot of continuity between administrations. I'm working on a project right now, a chapter in a book with Raj Shaw. We're talking about development lessons, and there's a lot of continuity um, be, between those. And there probably would be in a Hillary Clinton administration. As, at, as Secretary of State, she put a lot of emphasis on women's rights and empowerment issues in a very positive way, I think. Um, and I believe, you know, one of the, you've had the development of heroes, uh, in, from my perspective, or uh, champions of these issues among people like uh, Marco Rubio, who has become a real defender of AIDS funding and uh, development more broadly. Um, that's a victory, but right now it's being uh, overshadowed by a fundamental debate about, the, about this kind of, what populism entails. The, the only thing I would add to that, because um, I'm, I, I need money from all of them, so I'm not going <laughs> to uh, But uh, is the, the strength of the bipartisan, there is, there is more bipartisanship on at least some issues than you would think is imaginable based on what you read. So in development, really, uh, despite budget issues and all the problems, there's still a strong bipartisan consensus uh, admittedly not as strong as it was five or six years ago because there's a lot of changes in members. But that's not because they're instinctively not interested. It's because they don't, it takes a lot to re-educate them. And, <coughs> you know, we've seen members come in from very conservative districts who, who become champions. And one thing I think, it, Lindsey Graham, I'm, I shouldn't say anything because he's still running for president, but, you know, as chair of the committee that funds us, has been a huge supporter yeah, in great. the Senate. He, you know, he just had a hearing not long ago on it. Kay Granger in the House chairs our committee, huge supporter. They all, they, somehow they find a way to make it work and they have enough support uh, and they actively take people to the field so they can see what, what Mike saw. Uh, so there is really strong support. Um, the, and one of the key things is it's actually the social conservatives that believe most deeply in development. Fiscal conservatives don't, it's the social conservatives that do. But it's keeping the education going, it's keeping the, the knowledge going, and, um, and keeping the success. The, one of the biggest reasons we've maintained financing and their support, and they say this on the floor all the time, is because of the results. Yeah. You know, as long as you are showing results, as long as you can show impact, there is a belief that we still have a role in the world. But, as Mike said, if, if it shifts towards an isolationist, internal looking, view, then that consensus could unravel. Okay, did you have a question? Last question. Okay. Uh, my name is Josh, I'm a MD PhD student here in the School of Public Policy. Uh, thanks a lot for the discussion, I thought it was really great. Um, I was gonna go back to TB and just wanted to hear uh, what you thought about, I uh, didn't talk at all about uh, drug resistance as a challenge uh, in your discussion. Obviously it has uh, some origins at least in the dry spell of uh, anti-tuberculosis drugs out there, um, but certainly logistic mm -hmm. issues as well. I just wanted to hear what you say about that. And I'd be interested also on uh, malaria treatment, what, what is being seen as yep. far as resistance as well. That's and yeah, because it's an important point, because we have malaria resistance and we have HIV resistance, and we have, we're gonna have growing HIV resistance because of the uh, adherence, which is not necessarily, any, in fact, it's not worse in Africa than in the United States in many settings, but it's a, we have, we're gonna have resistance problems. So MDRTB is a huge issue that's getting more attention than malaria and HIV resistance is because of you know, hyper stories like people getting on planes and spreading it. Mm -hmm. um, and in Eastern Europe, there's a massive problem and in parts of Southern Africa. But, um, and this gets back to how outrageous it is that you know, we treat people for six, you know, we have six month curative therapy. MDRTB is a failure of treatment. Uh, the way you get MDRTB is predominantly by people not taking their regimens. Now, there's spread 
now because people get it and then spread it, but by coughing, but most of it is because people don't take their drugs or don't take them enough, and it's six months. But your, your range of successful programs is from 30% to 99% or 95% success. So what we're trying to do is focus on what is it that gets you to the 95%. And one of the problems in Eastern Europe is they're still based in the Soviet hospitalization approach. One of the problems in, the problem in Southern Africa, a big piece of it is migratory mine workers. So let's focus on what the problem is and try to solve it. My concern around MDRTB is it's very expensive to diagnose and it's very expensive to treat and we have limited money. So if we throw all our money towards treating MDRTB, we are doomed because we're going to fail even more in the treatment and that means we're gonna have a never ending and rapidly growing pool of MDRTB. So we have to find that balance and to support countries to find the balance. Malaria resistance is very concerning too in the Mekong Valley we're seeing, the only way to solve resistance is to eliminate. And that's what we're focused in the Mekong on. We're in a little better shape with drugs in uh, malaria. There are some new therapies coming that we hope will be available in the next couple of years that will actually get us around the resistance problem, the, the issue will be cost. Um, but it's a, and HIV really worries me um, because of the way we made nonsense out of treatment regimens um, where we could have one three and one drug combination for first line and one three and drug second line with no cross resistance if people would just have the guts to make those kinds of public health decisions. Instead we have so many regimens thrown all over the place that you know, we could end up with a big mess with a very difficult uh, way to cover back and if we start seeing death, we could actually see a situation where death rates are going back to where they were because of drug resistance and HIV and try to get money out of anyone for that when your rates go back up or for malaria or TB. So these are huge issues and, and I, to be honest I, I think too many people have their heads in the sand on this um, about what's coming and, and how to deal with it. Um, but the, the thing about TB, I, uh, you know, we are the biggest funder of MDR TB programs and proud to be so, but I do worry that we're gonna follow silver ball shiny objects and, and lose basic programs that will prevent MDRT. <laughs> thank you. So thank, my, I wanna express for all of you my thanks to, uh, first for being here and sharing their thoughts. After all, we don't often have on one podium those of you coming, working, being in the field of global health, uh, Michael, who was so influential in working with President Bush on the malaria initiative and on PEPFAR, and, and Mark, who led, who, had, who led PEPFAR and is now leading the Global Fund. These are remarkable individuals, and we thank them for being with us and sharing uh, their thoughts, and uh, I hope they've inspired all of you to move into your careers in global health and love what you do. Thank you again.